What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Zane Jaffer from Zane Ventures. Zane's a former operator with multiple exits under his belt, the most notable of those being Bungle's $780 million acquisition by Blackstone back in 2019. Since then, Zane switched over to the investment side and he's now working out of his family office called Zane Ventures, where he invests primarily in real estate and prop tech companies. In this talk, we cover prepping for a successful exit, non-obvious differences between family offices and traditional funds, and opportunities in the future of real estate. Everyone, welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. Today we have on Jane, or Zane Jaffer, who has both been a successful operator and successful investor, which is very, very rare. It's something that we cherish. Um, and with that, it'd be great to uh, maybe learn a little bit more about you, man. Give a quick introduction, say what's up, smile, all that good stuff. Sure. Thanks for having me on the show. So I've been a, an entrepreneur most of my life, but right now I'm sitting in the seat of a, an investor after selling my last company. Uh, it was a pretty big exit. I started a company called Vungle, which was in the mobile advertising space that was bought by Blackstone a couple of years ago for 780 million. And since then, I have been investing primarily in real estate and in technology startups. Although I have, you know, I manage my family office as well which is multi-asset focused. But most of the stuff these days I do via a uh, private equity fund, I'm a general partner at called Bluefield Capital. Um, Bluefield has billions of dollars of um, real estate, things like multifamily housing, hotels, senior care facilities, industrial warehouses. And we also have a venture capital fund that invests in startups. Uh, when I say startups, I mean startups that are in the real estate technology sector as well. That is really, really cool. I mean, you've been doing this for, for a decade now. And um, that said, like, you've seen that plus going through it on the operating side. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to go through that exit, make this transition, prepare for it, et cetera? Yeah, I've been doing it for two decades, actually. I started my first thing when I was a teenager, 13, 14 years old. And so now I'm, you know, mid thirties or 34. And, um, eventually you only have the frame of reference that, you know, you have, right. So most of my frame of reference has been as a hungry founder with, uh, <laughs> you know, bootstrapping, not taking a salary for many years. Uh, so it was quite a surprise or a shock to suddenly, you know, get a big windfall of cash. Um, but it doesn't change much because, um, you know, if you've, if you've been engineering that muscle and you're just so used to being on the hunt and being on the hunt here for a founder is, you know, building companies, trying to find product market fit, trying to scale things, uh, that's ultimately, you know, the mode you're in. And so it's very abnormal to be sitting on, um, you know, and focusing on the capital allocator side of things when in my heart, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, a founder and, and builder, um, so that's what it feels like. It feels like, okay, I've, I've got all this cash and stuff, but that's not necessarily, uh, you know, what I enjoy as much as uh, the building part of it. And cool. I think we hear that from a lot of uh, founders who are, have been in the founder's shoe most of their lives and have an exit. Um, yes, yeah, some retire, but I think they're quite antsy. But I think many just jump back on the horse. So why did you choose the path that you did? Why not start more companies? Why go into PE and VC? Like, how did that all come about for you? You know, there's some, um, there is some madness in the strategy here. Um, or rather strategy in the madness, but, you know, it sounds mad actually when you put it that way, right? What the hell am I doing on PE and, and asset management? So um, I know I want to start another company and I thought to take more of a systematic approach. When I started my first company, I saw mobile apps were taking off. And, you know, I threw spaghetti against the wall and I tried to figure out what potential business ideas and business models can take off as mobile apps are taking off. And 
you know, I just managed to start something in the mobile advertising space and videos, and that's what became big. Um, this time around, it wasn't throw spaghetti at the wall. It's, let's be really thoughtful. This time, let's find something I'm passionate about. Let's um, really go deep into the industry. I got quite lucky, I think, uh, in my you know first major exit. But this time I thought, let me try to be an industry expert. Let me try to see the industry inside out and really try to find the opportunity and also get compensated for doing that, right? So for me, I thought real estate's an industry that I think would be really, really interesting to start a company in. So let me start by buying and selling real estate. I'll really then understand real estate from a unique perspective. Then let me start to invest in startups in the real estate sector through the VC fund that we, we launched. And so that's been why I've been doing what I've been doing. It does ultimately lead to eventually I want to start another company. Um, but in the meantime, in the absence of doing that, learn, learn a few things, right? It takes a lot of trust to hand over your money to, uh, you know, wealth managers and asset managers. So learn the trade a little bit inside out. And um, if I want to do a company, I think in real estate tech is a good, good area to do it in. Why not get some firsthand on the ground experience? So when I am ready, I have a platform, I have a network, and I have a deep understanding of the customer problems. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, you know, why not get paid to learn? And at that, I get paid a ton. Um, I, I do want to at some point dive more into why real estate. But um, I guess the, the, the follow on to that is, are you focused mostly on commercial or residential? Just so the people here, if they see Yeah, something. mostly commercial. Although I have done some residential, but um, when I say residential, I mean, the end outcome is to have someone pay rent. So it's more of a commercial way of looking at residential. So it's mainly commercial. Got it. Okay. Can you dive a little bit into what it's been like for you to be doing a fund and a family office simultaneously? And what are some of the differences? Yeah, no, it, honestly, it's been such a headache trying to do two things at once. Um, at the beginning, you know, when you build your own company, you're so used to people telling you it can't be done. And when you do it, you start to not trust what people say. So it's quite skeptical of most people who wanted to manage my money and invest it. And I thought I should invest it myself. And over time, I realized, actually, there are specialists that can do a far better job than I can do. And this is a common transition people have when, you know, they build a company, uh, they have a chip on the shoulder, no one believed in them. And then when you have all this money, everyone comes, you know, crawling out of the woodwork, knocking on the door and wants to suddenly manage your money and has, you know, world-class investment opportunities in quotation marks. So um, I thought, I don't trust anyone. I'm going to just do this myself. So I started, you know, pretty much doing like hedge fund type of activities, private equity, you know, fixed income, a, a lot of stuff, right? Investing in money managers. I, I've invested in at this point, almost a hundred different fund managers across different asset classes. And I also decided, let me do my own stuff as well. And I think real estate is a good case study for um, why it's better to work with a specialist and to have a platform. So when I started investing in some real estate funds and projects, I was quite upset with the fact that they charge a management fee. They take a percentage of the profits, which is known as a carry or a promote. And um, they also charge acquisition fees as well. I, I, just, I just thought to myself, well, why? why? Why give so much to these people? I can do this myself, surely. And they're generating crazier you know, returns. If I did it myself, I'd generate even more. So, you know, a greedy mindset, right? So I did that. I went out and I started buying multifamily apartment buildings and single family rentals and doing my own stuff. And some time passed and I saw the returns of the funds I gave money to and they were, were crushing me. They had far better returns and that's net. And I thought to myself, how is this possible? Here I am and it's my project, my money, and I'm not generating the same returns as someone else who I'm paying fees to. And that's sort of when I realized, okay, let's just outsource everything that isn't a strength and let's, you know, uh, team up with like a specialist. So I teamed up with Bluefield Capital and now I do all my real estate uh, and startup investing through that vehicle and through that fund. Uh, and, you know, I, I sort of handed off the family office to a lot of, uh, you know, l l like a big wealth manager. And I still, I still am very actively involved in that. I do make startup investments that aren't in real estate, probably invested in fifth, over 50 startups now. Uh, but most of my focus is really just real estate. Got it. 
when you were looking at those feet or the the performance, was that they were crushing you net of fees? Yeah, net of fees. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Okay. Very impressive. Um, yeah, with well, that, it it tells you though that you you can't just walk into this. You'll be taken advantage of, you know. Um, firstly, I have a British accent, so they know I'm not from you know, the U.S. But even worse, I live in the Bay Area in California, Silicon Valley. When you're calling up um, the seller or, or brokers and they see the six five zero or four one five Bay Area code, they know ooh, you know someone who's in tech is calling. Uh, this is great. This is the ideal buyer for this asset, right? Uh, and the price goes up, and they know you're not sophisticated. Whereas when you're with a when you're with a larger platform, they have institutional relationships, they have you know extremely good access to capital sources, they can leverage up in ways that you can't as an individual, even if you have an insane balance sheet, right? Um, you know, being able to get non recourse debt at really low terms having a Rolodex of brokers who know that you've got a reputation in the market that you'll close quickly. Whereas if you're a new person on the block, you're just some tech guy in Silicon Valley buying real estate versus, you know, with Bluefield, they've got, you know, decades of experience and they've been buying in so many uh, areas in the U S across so many asset classes for, for over a decade now. So you can't compete with that really. And then you also, you know, you've got the first-hand experience of which property managers are good, which aren't, which construction firms are really good and which ones aren't. And that's just an unfair advantage, I would say, versus coming in new, even if you don't have to pay fees. Sometimes it's better to just a partner with a specialist, even if you have to pay the fees. The same goes with like, you know, paying commissions to your salespeople when you run a startup, right? That should be the biggest expense. And you should be proud of that. They also say, in the same way, you know, um, even if you're paying a big tax bill when you sell your company, that's success because, you know, it's, it's an indicator, right? A lagging indicator that, you know, you did something good. So in the same way, if you're paying a lot of fees, especially um, on the uh, promote side, that's a good indicator because that means that that, you know, sponsor crushed it and they delivered great returns for you. Very, very true. How did you decide which managers you wanted to invest in initially? Uh, there wasn't really a well thought out process. It was just ask for referrals from other founders and other people who have worked with them and what sounds good. <laughs> Anyone <laughs> can make representations and show you their deck. Um, so, you know, part of it is looking at that, but a big part of it is, all right, is this someone I can learn from? Uh, is this someone who I trust with my money? And do they have a track record of delivering these returns for other people and do the references check out? And I think that's the way most people still look at it, you know? Um, there is another way of looking at it too, which sort of came afterwards. At the beginning, it was, I want to invest in everything. Later, it was like, okay, wait, wait, let's take a look at the entire picture. What is my goal here? Ultimately, I want to grow my wealth, but I want to protect it. Let's, let's, let's create a strategy. Let's make sure we're diversifying into these particular, you know, areas. So a certain amount of money going to stocks and some going to fixed income, some going to alternatives. And then you break that down further, even when it comes to stocks, right? Then you're thinking, okay, I want exposure, obviously, to the broad market, which managers can do that and which managers can do that in a tax efficient way or beat the market. But also, well, there's a world outside of the U.S., so I'm, I'm interested in our emerging markets. I'm interested in the European markets, the Asian markets. So how do I get exposure to that? Which fund managers can give me exposure to that? And also, you know, let's just say, like, you know, I, I want to have more small cap, right? Not just large cap. Well, which fund manager is going to give me small cap? Which fund manager is going to give me high growth? So you kind of, you can create a strategy where you look at your entire portfolio and it becomes a really big exercise, and then each part of your portfolio impacts another part, right? You've got to look at you, the different levels of risks. There's liquidity risk, there's market risk, there's systemic risk, there's business risk, there's interest rate risk, there's inflation risk, there's all these different risks, right? You want to manage your portfolio in a way to minimize risk and maximize returns. And it's not as simple as let me put, you know, 50% into the S&P 500 and 50% into bonds. That's sort of a really basic way of doing it. Eventually it gets extremely detailed and that's why you end up with like a hundred fund managers each deploying various strategies and it, it becomes a full-time operation to manage. Yeah, totally agreed. I've been actually in the midst of setting up a family office structure. I managed the money for a few generations of the SD Lauder estate, which is 
this is all fascinating. You're looking at it very, very similarly. Um, I feel like I went a little bit off course because while this is incredibly fascinating, a lot of our readers are like still like, or not readers, but listeners are still very, very deep into the investing side. Now that I know that you're that thorough on this, I would love for you to dive into your thesis on the future of prop tech. Especially right now in this climate, you know, this is going out in August, I guess, and um, we've come through COVID. We are, who knows, but, you know, crypto hasn't performed very well. Most asset classes are getting destroyed. Uh, the startup asset class has really been hurt quite hard over the last few quarters. Um, there aren't many safe havens you can go to in an environment like this. And real estate is a very strong area because the underlying customer base, you know, are people that, that are going to spend on rents. I mean, if you're talking about that part of commercial real estate, right? Um, so if you take a step back, real estate's a really good inflation hedge. And real estate's a really good market. Um, guess what, though? What do those customers buy? They buy technology. And real estate's so antiquated that there's a lot of room for disruption. So PropTech looks really good from a future perspective. Um, I think it offers exposure to uh, startups in a way that is a lot less risky than investing in other markets like consumer tech, hardware, fintech, health tech, whatever other you know, category of startups you want to look at. So I'm very excited about PropTech because the underlying customer base has solid fundamentals working for it. They need technology. Technology solves a real problem. And the underlying customer base isn't going to be correlated to the broader market, which looks like you know it's not doing very well and it's struggling. So PropTech looks great. Now within PropTech, you've got you know general areas where technology is needed, but then you've got disruptive areas that are going to completely change you know the very nature of PropTech. Like you know how Web three and blockchain is going to uh, impact PropTech is is just really fascinating. But then you've also got things like people run their businesses on spreadsheets, and you can just bring in tools and technology to automate that workflow automation tools, uh, which, you know, can seriously cut costs and improve revenues. So PropTech's exciting. It's, it's, you know, it's got two types of opportunities. One that seems very obvious, bring in tech to replace spreadsheets and automate, you know, things that are very manual. And the other is this industry is about to go through massive disruption and uh, making bets there is really, uh, could be really lucrative. Totally agree. Clay. Do you have any uh, additional questions or thoughts? And um, if not, we should let Zane ask us whatever he'd like, like literally anything in the world. And then we can dive right into our quick fire. I, mean, I think you asked all the questions I was going to. I'll just save the questions I got for quick fire. But yeah, Zane, you have any questions for us before diving into that? Um, what do you guys think about the current climate? Is it a good time to start a business? Um, is it a bad time and it's worth waiting because it's hard to access capital? I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on that. Tyler, you want to go first? Yeah, I've actually just been doing a pretty profound study on this. So I think that it's an incredible time to start a business. I think in, in, in environments like we've just gone through, People are not capital efficient. They are consistently raising above what their valuation should be. And because of it, if you don't come in at the earlier stages, as an investor, you're in a bad position. And if you're a founder, should you be at the tail end of one of these situations, you end up having to downsize, rethink about how you run your business, scale, et cetera, and you start having to cut back, but your employee base may not be able to sustain and your growth rate may not be able to sustain without declining severely. So I think that's a thing. And then two, I think, if you think of the timeline from starting a company, so like if you start a company, you can assume that it may take 10 plus years to get it to a point of like a solid exit. It may be like three years to get it to somewhere reasonable as like a functioning venture backed business. Mm -hmm. These cycles actually aren't that long. So you find yourself in a position where you had to be capital efficient. You had to find investors who truly believed in what you were doing. 
your employees and team build a culture around these types of things and expect that they have to be scrappy. And then when you've built a healthy business, the market starts to do a ramp up, capital becomes more abundant. You don't have to dilute yourself as much because you're a very fundamentally sound business and your exit horizons look very similar because at that point, you still have three to five years where you have an exit window, which hopefully you start to see some type of like uptick or bubble in the market for me and you're in a great spot. So I think people who start funds in this vintage or people who start companies in, the, in this vintage tend to find themselves doing better than the folks who are at the tail end of a bubble. Yeah, I just echo all that. I mean, I think there's probably going to be two things that'll change the most as the market kind of stays in this correction territory if it doesn't even go lower but i think one there's just going to be more of a priority on capital efficiency obviously revenue per employee i think a lot of people were just focused on growth at all costs never really looked at unit economics over the last really 10 15 years i think it's hard to argue that won't change especially as capital dries up or at least becomes um like less or more hesitant to invest in companies with high burn rates. And I think also companies are just going to be forced to find more creative ways to acquire customers. Um, I think a lot of people invested heavily into social over the last 10 years. Again, that's made social a really crowded channel to acquire customers. Um, And I think a lot of ad budgets are drying up as people are just trying to figure out what their next move is. So all that said, I think people are just going to have to figure out better ways to acquire customers, whether that's through own channels like email, phone, something else, um, or something else that I'm not thinking of. But those are kind of the two things that, at least from the talks I've had with other people, um, two things that I think will change the most with the downturn. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that If, and we're starting to see the first wave of layoffs now, but more and more layoffs are coming. Obviously they're coming because startups are being taught to cut their burn and large companies aren't, you know, have to show more uh, capital efficiency because there are, um, you know, their revenue multiples and EBITDA multiples are declining. So if if all of that happens, it's great if you still have some dry powder because you can hire talent. It's been really difficult to, to hire talent and talent's very flighty. Talent usually, you know, stays for a, t- a bit and then jumps because they get a higher offer. So if you can uh, grow sustainably in this period, you can also build a really strong bench of talent. And the goal is, I think, with one or two years passing, and my hope is this only lasts one or two years. This this you know situation that we find ourselves in, and you're you're in a place where your team is fully ramped up. You've got a sound business model. And um, you've got great talent, right? Um, that you otherwise, you know, never could have afforded previously. And um, ultimately, I think that makes you a much stronger and better resilient company. Yeah, I think to to top that off, <clears throat> this would be one of the best times ever to be doing a studio model, because typically studios, the economics don't work that well in a world where people should just start everything themselves. But studios get in early, they can deploy capital, strategy, et cetera, efficiently. And right now, the deal that a studio can offer someone when they're afraid of the market huh. is an incredibly attractive deal. True. That, that, that's very true. It reminds me that um, I um, started, you know, the company before the one that was uh, acquired. I started that in the middle of the uh, recession because um, in 2008, 2009, I graduated and I um, I couldn't get a job in finance and consulting. And I thought to myself, well, I don't really have a choice now. I'm going to have to just start a company. And I think what's going to happen now is a lot of people who have been laid off are going to struggle in the job market because people are laying off. People are rescinding offers. It's a perfect excuse and a perfect time to just start a company. There's, there's yeah, no reason. So entrepreneurial, when, you, when, you, when you're down to your last dollar, you figure it out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you start something. Humans are survivors and ambitious humans, typically when they're, when they're in a really tough spot, they go bigger, especially if they have an opportunity to. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be disillusioned too, especially if they're being laid off. 
they're not going to understand that cognitive dissonance is too much. Like, hold on, you were courting me, you were promising me all these things. Now I worked for this company, I was laid off, my options are underwater, I may have had to early exercise, which could have cost me a lot. I hate corporate. I don't trust companies. I want to disrupt this, you know, I want to, I want to and that chip on the shoulder could actually create a big entrepreneurial force for many people to start companies. So that, that wisdom that it's a great time to start a company isn't just rational. It's going to happen because people are frustrated and they don't really have a choice when your back's up against the corner and you get creative and you don't take the easy way out. And the easy way out for many people is just checking in for a nine to five and getting paid handsomely to stay. And, you know, the more you stay in these companies, <laughs> the more enticing the retention uh, and uh, salary increases are. So, um, yeah, lo lots of companies are probably going to be built in this environment and there'll be much better, stronger companies as a result. Yeah, I'm very excited to be well capitalized and to be coming off of understanding how to build community with founders, investors, et cetera, and having built a studio. So I think you, us, a lot of folks who are gearing up now are just very well positioned. But yo, Clay, we miss you. I wanna hear about or hear your voice a lot, lot more. Can you please take us into quick fires? Yep, let's do it. Saying so, we have these five questions meant to be answered in two sentences or less. First one we've got is what is a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? People say fail fast, fail often. I think it's incomplete advice. You need to add fail cheap as well. Yeah, 100%, especially now. I mean, just kind of echoing off everything we just talked about. Totally agree with that. Um, in the last year, what new belief, behavior, habit has most improved your life? Uh, I think reading a lot. I, I read obsessively now. Uh, I make it a habit. Try sometimes the first thing when I wake up and the last thing when I go to sleep. And I've devoured, I think, over 100 books in the last 12 months. Uh, I also speed read, too, so that helps. But um, that's been a life-changing habit. What's the best book you've read over the last 12 months? Uh, you know, the scariest book I read would be Blitzscaling, especially now because um, Blitzscaling sort of goes through the approach of like to spend money quickly, right? Even if the model isn't figured out. And you can somewhat see a case study here of like, wow, that advice can be really bad in situations where the market turns. So I enjoyed reading that book because it gave me the perspective of, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that extreme greed and aggression and how it can backfire. Of course, the book doesn't talk about it backfiring as much. Yeah. It talks about how it's a good strategy, but I enjoyed reading it because it's like, wow, read that book and you can understand why things went wrong. And look, that strategy has a time and a place. Airbnb, Uber, and many platforms had to operate like that, but not everyone should be operating like that. Yeah, and it's crazy. A lot of people just took that as gospel and never yeah. really considered the other side of that. So I totally, I remember reading that a while ago um, and I kind of molded my brain a little bit made me think that was the only way to build a company and obviously right. not uh, aside from having to say no all the time what's the worst part about venture you know I, I hinted to this that um, for me because I am a former founder I get very very antsy like you talk to another founder on the other side and you're like they're having a lot more fun I mean obviously they're not right uh, it's a lot of pain and struggle but every time you you talk to a founder and you see their progress, you're like, wow, man, they're doing it. I, I'm missing out. I think I should jump back and start a company. So I always feel like is now the time, is now the time. And I, th I think eventually I will do a company. But for me being in venture, it's like, do I really belong here in venture? Uh, I feel like I'm more of a founder, an entrepreneur, and other founders and entrepreneurs recognize that. Um, also, I tend to find that uh, founders come to me a lot for operational help much more than I think they would with other VCs because I just naturally gravitate towards that company building uh, skill set, right? More so than traditional venture. Yeah, resonate with that a lot. I think um, having experienced both, I think building's a lot more fun than investing and having to say no all the time. So totally agree with you there. Next question we've got, we've got two more here. So a lot of our audience is kind of skewing towards the younger side. So like think analysts, associates, principals, even a lot of people trying to break into VC. What's your best piece of advice for these groups of people like junior VCs or those aspiring to break into venture? 
for me, it's an unconventional piece of advice, and that would be learn to program, get deep into the weeds, uh, build something, because then you'll appreciate what it takes to build a company and the technology stack. And a lot of early stage founders, they tend to outsource their tech, and it's important you understand the risk of outsourcing tech. Uh, and also, a lot of founders will use buzzwords, and this happened a lot, I'd say a year or two ago, even with me, founders are always using the words like, oh, we have AI and machine learning, and they just use cutting edge buzzwords. And when you're like, well, how does that work? What, what, what backend are you using? How, how does, you know, is that a proprietary model or is that, you know, a few lines you just used on open source? Suddenly you'll be able to separate the talkers from the actual doers. And um, it's quite surprising when you start to dri drive into the tech, you realize, wait, this, this CTO isn't really qualified to be a CTO, you know? And, um, well, this person I'm talking to is an amazing founding engineer and yes, they can build this and that reduces the risk. So yeah, that, that would be my advice. Um, get, 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 get a little bit technical. It will really give you a unique perspective. And founders also, and technology founders really respect it when the VC can actually understand, you know, at the end of the day, you're building a shipping technology. And um, that, that is something VCs don't usually uh, empathize with because they have no context unless they, you know, unless they've got the technical context, which is rare. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. I think, I mean, worst case scenario, like even if you don't really become competent in coding, I think it's impossible to take six months, 12 months, however long to like really learn the basics of programming and not just become better at solving problems, which I mean, that skill set's not going to go out of style anytime soon. So worst case scenario, at least improve your problem solving ability. Best case scenario. Yeah, it's not even about becoming a competent coder. You'll never be a competent coder if you weren't, <laughs> if you don't, unless you do this full time and you, you know, you put all your hours into it. But you'll be amazed that just a few lines of code can create beautiful outputs. And sometimes there's a lot of no code solutions you can implement. And so I'll often see founders sometimes building something in house where I think, why don't you just use an external library for that? Why are you trying to reinvent the wheel? And my God, th there's this library you can implement that will save you all of this stuff you're trying to do for this component so you can focus on the meat and the core of it. Uh, so I think trying to learn how to code and doing a few tutorials will really show you too, wow, it, you, you can actually get a lot done really quickly. Um, and then, you know, you struggle to understand why this product looks the way it does when they're pitching you or, or why um, their deadlines look the way they do. You know, it, it just gives you a little bit more uh, empathy and um also you just have a better bs radar detector i think as well yeah couldn't agree more last question we got is who's a mentor of yours that you'd want to give credit to uh so many mentors honestly um one guy comes to mind who i must disclose was an investor in my last startup and is an investor in one of our funds but uh his name is goku rajaram he's He's on the board of uh, Coinbase and Square and um, was the CEO of DoorDash recently. He really believed in us when I was building my company. It felt like when I built my last company, everyone was telling me this is an awful idea. It's never going to work. And he was one of the few investors who said, look, at the end of the day, I don't know if the idea will work or not, but you have passion and you're going to kick yourself if you don't go ahead and pursue this. So you know what? I think you shouldn't pivot. Everyone else is telling you you should pivot. I think you should validate this further and don't listen to these other investors. Just focus on what the customer says. And he was like the only voice that was positive when most people were pooping on my idea, you know? I mean, in hindsight, you think it's crazy. People thought apps were not going to succeed. But this is a time and age where... Um, Blackberries, you know, were around and apps looked awful, farting apps, flashlight apps. People were like, why aren't you building something for the desktop, the web? This mobile thing is never going to take off. And if you're going to do mobile, do mobile web. I was like, no, I really believe we should build a native solution for mobile apps. And um, he was one of the few voices who actually, uh, you know, encouraged us. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, mobile apps are going to be big, right? It was more like, you know what? If you have something in your gut you believe in, follow it. And I think that's really foundational advice that you can take with you, you know, in any situation in life. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. Well, 
I think that wraps it up for quick fire. I know we just ran through a lot of questions with you. Um, but thanks so much for coming on. This has been awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Huge thanks again to Zane for coming out this week. We hope that each of you are able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Zane, you can find the social info in the description below. And if you're looking to check out his family office's website, that is going to be at zane slash adventures.com. Hope that helps. For next steps, if each of you have not submitted your info to become a member yet, you can do that through our website at www.confluence.vc. And also, if you want to become a subscriber to the newsletter, we offer a ton of free resources in there each and every week meant to help you become better at your individual roles. You can subscribe there at www.confluence.substack.com. Hope that helps. Hope to hear from you all soon.